Good morning. We are going to be in Amos chapter 4 as God gives us time to study His Word together. We will step into that in just a moment. Uh, I do want to say that I'm glad to be with all of you. It's good to see you here this morning. And I, and I do say that frequently, but there's just a lot of ways that that happens. And I, I realized this morning, and I, I do almost every Sunday, I just don't mention it. But um, one thing about me and, and the work that I do is that I, I typically will work throughout the day here at the building, and it is awfully quiet throughout the week. Um, and I get here early on Sunday morning, go, go over the things I need to be saying today, the things that I prepared to review them one last time. And it starts off very quiet, so it's like every other day that I come to the building. Uh, but then something happens, and, and I hope you know what that is, uh, a voice. I hear the door open, and I, I know that someone's coming in. And I say, well, at least one person's here. Good, someone will be here. But then shortly after that, uh, there are several voices, and then there's laughter. And, uh, you know, from my office, I long for Sunday and I long for Wednesday night, not to be alone, but to be with all of you. And so it's just a blessing to be with you this morning. I mean that. As I said, it happens in a lot of different ways, but that, that's one that is special to me. We're going to look at Amos chapter 4 together, and we'll read the first three verses to start us off. But before we do that, Amos chapter 1, we're, we're told that Amos is a prophet who's been called by God to prophesy to Israel during the reign of Uzziah, the king of Judah, Jeroboam the second the king of Israel, and as I mentioned in the first lesson, this dates Amos at about 760 B.C. His name, Amos, means burden bearer. He is working as a shepherd in Tekoa, and the Lord will call him to prophesy to Israel, which are the ten tribes to the north. So Tekoa is south of Jerusalem. God calls Amos to go north to a land he's not familiar with, doesn't know very well. He's a shepherd. Uh, he tends with sycamore fruit or tends to sycamore fruit. Um, and something else that I didn't mention last lesson for Amos, but needs to be said here and now, and should have been said last time I had done this, uh, Israel is living in a time of great wealth and prosperity. Amos is coming to tell them that there is a dark and ominous cloud that is moving over them. And, and that's important for us because in the moment when a prophet comes and says, you better repent, God is going to curse you, if you're listening to that and you evaluate your daily life and you say, actually, this, things are as good as they've ever been. So under Jeroboam II, they have the most property that they've ever had, except for under Solomon. They, strategically and militarily, they're the strongest they've ever been Jero, under Jeroboam II. So, so they have the most land they've ever possessed in this, in this time. And again, it's hard for them to hear these words and say, that sounds about right. Because by the daily life that they live, there's blessing, there's great wealth, there's a lot of good things going on. But again, the Lord is seeing their tendencies that they have left him, certainly, even under Jeroboam the first, they had set up these false gods. There was already this departure from the living God. And he's starting to step in now and to say, you better get turned around because things are about to become awful for you. And I think that's a beautiful thing about God. He doesn't wait and watch them fail and, and writhe in pain and then stand over them and go, I told you, go back to Deuteronomy 28. That's not how the Lord works. He, there's warning given when there's peace and there's privilege and there's wealth. God says, get this straight. I'm not pleased with this. Fix it now. And they have an opportunity to do that, to stand with the Lord again. And, and I want to keep that in our minds because it's important. It's not that they're under great pressure now, but they're going to be. They've already stepped into idolatry. They're worshiping Baal, and Molech, the, pa the pagan practice practices that were associated with Asherah. And so they're steeped in idolatry at this point. Let's read Amos chapter 4, the second sermon from Amos to Israel. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Now, <laughs> Ladies, <laughs> I did not write this. We're reading it together. We're studying it together. So let's just, let's just see what the prophet says and why this applies. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. This is a warning from God. 
The Lord God has sworn by His holiness, Behold, the day shall come upon you when He will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. House of Bashan is a direct statement to the women of Israel. We see that because at the conclusion of this verse, he says, you go and you say to your husbands. Uh, Bashan, the land of Bashan, was well known for its rich pasture land. It is east of the Jordan between Hermon and the mountains of Gilead. Uh, the cattle that, that grazed there always flourished and thrived through, throughout the generations. Moses, as he warns the people about forgetting God and the consequences that would come from that, the lambs and the rams of Bashan are mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 14. And, and there Moses says, by the word of God, I gave you the fatted rams of the breed of Bashan. So that, that says something to them. They know what that means, the rams. Not just the rams, not just the fatted rams, the ones of Bashan. It was a very, very unique place. And the, and the cattle that grazed there would always thrive. And so now he's saying, it's a derogatory statement, you cows of Bashan, you have taken of the, be the very best that I gave to you and that I fed to you, and you've used those things to turn your heart away from me. They are saying to themselves and to their husbands, let us drink our fill of wine that we took by force by oppressing the poor and crushing the needy. That is in our scripture reading already. If you look at Amos 2 in verse 6, or yeah, Amos 2 in verse 6, God has already warned the nation of Israel through Amos. Verse 6 says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and they pervert the way of the humble. So this is the accusation that God brings against them. These rich people who are oppressing the poor, it's not just that they're crushing the poor. God says you pant after the dust that rests on the head of the poor. Anything that belongs to the poor is mine. Anything. Even the dust. They say that's not yours either. I'm taking it by force. And so now God is stepping in as he's saying, you cows. And that's supposed to hurt. It's supposed to sting. It's supposed to, it's supposed to have the impact that it does on us this morning. How dare you say that about me or about my wife? And God says, no, that's the truth. Crush the needy. You pant after the dust that rests on the head of the poor. It is disgusting taking the blessings of God and then demanding more and more and more and never being filled. In verse 2, now he says, because of this, the Lord God has sworn by His holiness. He is trying to get their attention and to make an impression on them. He's saying when He says, I swear by my holiness, I will not relent. This will take place. I will take you away with fish hooks, He says. How's that sound? The first, I should clarify, the first word fish hooks in the New King James uh, is more accurately hooks or thorns. Some of your translations may say that, uh, hooks or thorns. Uh, the second one is actually fish hooks. And just consider the imagery that God says, I'm going to take you away. I'm going to pull you out by hooks. And the Syrians, the Syrian army is coming. I don't know that they did this specifically to the nation of Israel, but they were known to put either a hook and to those whom they had captured under the jaw and poking out through the mouth, and they were lined up and they were drug out of their cities. They also would use the hook, and it would go through the nose, but it would go deep inside. And, and the picture there is, you go nowhere but where you're led. You have no choice. You will walk until we say stop or until you die. It is an ugly scene. It's, and imagine again this day and time on this land this property, leaving your own home, walking out of your house with a hook in your face. And God says, it's coming, and I won't stop it from coming unless you turn back to me. He's saying to them, in the moment you're resting in your security and you're refusing to consider your own wickedness, you're going to be ripped away violently by a force that is much greater than you. This is a warning from God. 
as you sit in all of your luxury and as you pant after the dust on the head of the poor, this condition of your heart, the way that you're living, that you will be ripped out by force from everything you trusted in, just like the fish, when it is hooked and pulled out of its dwelling place. Think of the advantage that we have over the fish, assuming we hook them, because fish have a great advantage over me until, until one finds my hook. But when that takes place, just, just think about that when, that when the fish is hooked. Think about the detail that we've put into fishing. It's not just, well, give me a hook. It is, what are we fishing for? Because there's a hook for bass, there's a hook for catfish, there's a hook for sea creatures, there's a hook for freshwater fish, and they all have a purpose, and they all work beautifully, designed by men. So the hook is designed perfectly for the fish in which you are trying to catch. What about the rod and the strength of the rod? That there are rod for crappie, and th those are very flimsy. I'm, I'm not an expert on these things. I know a few experts. I am not one, but there's a rod for crappie, and then there's a rod for bass, there's a rod for catfish, and then as you step into the, the ocean, you need a bigger rod. You need a stronger rod. I had the privilege of taking John fishing last week, and we were fishing for catfish in a small pond, and I gave him a deep sea fishing rod <laughs> because we're low on rods, and I, I, I told him this rod is very heavy, so if you see anything move at all, you have a fish. Because I'm using a crappie rod, and my rod bends like, you know, it's about to break, and John's rod will never bend, no matter what comes out of that pond. And so I said, just be, be extra sensitive with that, because when they bite, you've got something. Uh, it's, not, it's not your typical rod. So just again, I, I, I'm using this for us to see that when a hook is placed into the fish's mouth, what chance does that fish have? As hard as it would fight to go down deeper, to go back to where it wanted to go. There's someone on the other side that is pulling with every advantage in the world. That fish can do nothing but come out of the water. And by the way, do fish enjoy being out of water? It's just, a, it's just an interesting picture. The fish has no choice. The fish is coming out. It won't live outside of water. Too bad. I make the decisions because I have hooked you and God's giving them this picture. And, and we want that to kind of sink into our hearts as we think about that. There would be those who would hear the words of Amos. And some are going to say, stop prophesying. Go home. Go away. Others may think, that man spoke directly to my heart and to my life, my daily life. Everything he said was true about me and my home. And God's given me an opportunity to turn. Wouldn't that be great? That someone would turn back to God who loved them. But he says you will be utterly helpless. You will be easily lifted out of the flood of pleasures in which you have trusted. After you are moved, others will sweep in and take your posterity by force. That word posterity for them is it's their children and their grandchildren. The Syrian army will sweep through and take those people out of that land, and then others, including the Syrians, will come back and clean house. They'll finish whatever is left, and God has told them word for word, not just you, you're going to be led out with hooks, but your children will be let out with hooks or with fish hooks. Can you give me an orange juice, please, out of the fridge? I knew at some point my blood sugar thing would go off while preaching, and it never did, but it just did now. So I need a little bit of orange juice so I will stay out of trouble. We will press on. Don't worry about me unless I start to teeter or fall over. Right now I'm doing okay. Verse 3, he says you will go out through broken walls in a straight line as cattle through the breach in a fence. He also says to them, you shall be cast into Harmon. This word or name has been debated since the day it was written. Harmon. It is literally Harman in the Hebrew. It's most likely Armenia or the mountains of Armenia, which is close to, if not right at the destination, the final destination that Assyria will take Israel. It may be speaking of the nature by which they are led out. Uh, Harman is a word, it's a similar word as given, thank you, that is, makes the point that, that you are jerked about as a um, cattle, oxen, something is led by something, that headlong, you are led headlong somewhere and you are cast about. Another word that is similar to this is the word palace. And a lot of our, um, those who have looked at the word of God, Bible scholars, a lot of them 
believe that, that it, God is saying the palace you're in to the palace you're going to. You're going to be jerked headlong into this palace. And though you enjoy harlotry in your luxury, you're going to be forced into it in a foreign land. And you're going to be jerked into that palace. None of those answers are good for the Israelites. Look at verse 4 with me. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. The golden calves were set up in, Gil, in Beth, Bethel and Dan by Jeroboam. Amos is rebuking all of their worship in both Dan and Gilgal. There was certainly heavy idol, idolatrous worship in Gilgal. And these two places had become famous for that worship. The statement from God, really as we look at it, is divine satire. Just verses 4 through 5. It is what I refer to as divine satire. He says, bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes every three days. Your Bible may have a note there for every three days, and it may say that it's supposed to be three years. Uh, Deuteronomy 14, 28, Deuteronomy 26 and verse 12 both say this, lay aside the tithe of your increase the third year, and, and take note of what this tithe is for. Every three years, there's a free will off offering. Set, set aside your tithe every three years. Give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled. And I believe that Amos is saying every three days. He's saying that on purpose. I think it's literally days, not, not years. He's saying days because they're, Amos, by the will of God, is driving home this point. He's pointing out the foolish hypocrisy of the people who come to Bethel and Gilgal, eager to pour out gifts. God's commandment was to give these gifts to the priest. They've come to give their gifts to false priests. Priests of false gods. And so he says, you come every three days. You're so excited to give to these priests who are not priests. And then the rest of that tithe, who's it supposed to go to? The fatherless, the widow, the stranger, those who have nothing else and need somewhere, somewhere to go to have something to eat. And so he's saying to them, you are going to these places and you're stepping into this religious practice, and you're as happy as you can be about it, because publicly, you're going to give your tithes. You're so eager, so eager to give to the poor. But who are these people? What did God say about them? They pant after the dust that settles on the heads of the poor. They're crushing the very people that they're pretending to help. It is disgusting to God. And so he says, yeah, you keep rushing out there and you just keep giving money so that the poor will be tended to and the priest will be cared for when you and I both know that is not your desire at all. This you love, O house of Israel. Why? Because it makes them look good, makes them feel good. I've done what I need to do. Now I can go back to what I was doing. And again, there's a picture for us. It's not... It's not an attendance record with the Lord. You stand before him and he say, how did you serve me? What did you do? Never miss services. Go on. What else you got? It's not Sunday and Wednesday that I was always right where I was told to be because I knew that would be enough. It is an individual who gives their heart and their life over. That, that for us as Christians, we, we look around, not just now thinking about the poor, but every day of our life, we think about someone who may need some help. And our heart's given over to that. You know, uh, how many times have we been challenged driving to the very store, to the very place that we just saved up enough money to go get that thing we want? So we've got the money in our pocket, and we've got the money in our account, we have the card we want to use, we're on our way to the store, and we drive by so many who need help. And we finally get that thing that we wanted, and then, as with most hobbies or most things we enjoy, it needs one more thing. And so we got to go get some more money. For it to be perfect, for it to be just right, we're going to need a few more dollars, and so here we go. And guess who's denied in all of that? The very people that God told us to be looking out for, to help, to assist. Give them something from yourself. 
It's not about you getting everything you ever wanted. Because again, we can see here, it never ends. It won't stop. You can't have enough. We're told in Ecclesiastes that those who love silver will never be satisfied with silver. And yet they love it. It's a pursuit that does not end. And it turns us into something that God doesn't want us to be. You can't go and offer sacrifices while at the same time live in carnality and crush the weak who are around you. He says again to them as, as this satire is given, offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Leaven was never to be used in sacrifices. He's pointing out the hypocrisy here. Go offer the sacrifices to God with leaven. Leaven's a picture of sin. That's why it was to be totally removed at certain times. Make sure there's no leaven in the house. Do not partake. Do not eat of leaven. Do not have leaven anywhere near you. It's a picture of sin. And now he's saying to them, go offer sacrifices with leaven, because that's what you're doing. So again, imagine the hypocrisy of someone sorting out all these things, making sure there's no leaven in the dough, and taking all those steps, and while at the same time, there is leaven that has saturated their life and their heart. It's broken and God will not accept it. He never has and he never will. Verse 6, also I gave you cleanness of teeth. This is not the invention of toothbrushes. This is something far worse. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all of your cities and lack of bread in all of your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. You click that for me? Thank you, Elliot. I also withheld rain from you. When there were still three months to the harvest, I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it had did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. God says to them, I have withheld rain from you. And then he says, I even did this in such a way that one city received rain and another two or three cities got no rain, all by the design and by the purpose of God. Can he do that? Well, he's not the weatherman. He doesn't predict rain. He controls it. He gives that to us in Deuteronomy, that he will seal up the heavens with bronze if they sin against him. And notice he's not done that. He's done something else. He's given them rain in certain areas. So it, there's, there's good things happening. As I pointed out, there's still wealth. There's good things happening in one city, but there's two or three where there's been no rain. They lost their crops. So you know what they have to do in the dry famine city? They're going to have to travel, which he mentions. They traveled to the city that was wealthy because of the rain, and they asked for help. And in all of those steps that they took, from their own home to the other place where they heard it was raining, in all of those steps... God was wanting them to say, you know what I think's wrong here? You know what's changed? It's always been rich and plentiful where we live, and now it's not. You know what's changed? Us. God promised us rain, and the latter rains have not come. The early rains have not come. They should have called upon God in those moments. And I want us to see as we look down through these verses that these things that we read about, they're corrective, not punitive. That's important for us. God is trying to bring them back to himself by these measures that he has laid out. It's not final punishment. Not yet. It's a rebuke. He says to them, I have done these things. And then he says, yet. And that's what he does over and over and over again. I have done these things and yet you have not returned to me. Look in verse 9. We actually see those two phrases in verses 6, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Five things he had done, and every time he says, Yet you did not return to me. Down in verse 9, I blasted you with blight and mildew. That sounds awful. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt infectious diseases your young men i killed with a sword along with your captive horses i made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils yet you have not returned to me says the lord i overthrew some of you as god overthrew sodom and gomorrah and you were like a firebrand firebrand plucked from the burning yet you have not returned to me says the lord 
blight and mildew on their gardens, on their crops, their vineyards, and their fig trees. Those that survived, he says, the locusts came in and devoured all of them. And, and you did not turn to me. There, there were diseases. And, and as, as Amos cries this out to the people, they're, they're able to evaluate these things that he's saying. We have been. We have been smitten with disease and pestilence, and we fought through those plagues, wondering who would die and who would live. And God says, that was done so that you would return to me. And he says, some of you I, I reserved, and I plucked out as a firebrand, out of the hot fire. I pulled you out. So again, you'd have time to think about where you are, what you've done, and why these things have come upon you. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought, what his thought is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Verse 13 is, is so powerful. God has formed the mountains, he creates the wind, and he even can declare to man his thoughts, and he can even declare to man his thoughts before they've happened. And these people know that, we know that. You go back to Deuteronomy 28, when Moses warns them about this very moment in time. He, he doesn't say if, sometimes he does, but he, he changes from if to when. Do not, do not leave the commandments that I have given to you from God. And they swore to him, we will not forget the commandments. We will obey all things that God has given to us. Moses, you have our word. Imagine such a gathering where people, all of them said, we will not. We will be accountable to you. We'll be accountable to God. And we'll hold each other accountable. We will not leave or abandon the commandment of God. And as Moses is speaking to them by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, he says, when you forget... Can you imagine that? We just swore to him that we wouldn't forget. And he says, great. So when you forget, remember this. God is dealing with you. He is talking to you. Because you're going to forget. And Moses tells them why. Because of the fatness of the land. You're going to sit. You're going to eat. You're going to enjoy. You have everything you could ever desire or dream of because God had given it to you beforehand. It had already been determined. Do not take these things for granted and turn your back on the one who gave them. It is the worst thing you could possibly do. God loves you. You're his children. He's demonstrated his power before your eyes daily. Don't leave him. Okay, we swear. Good. Now, when you leave him, remember this. You know, that, that, that's embarrassing. And yet, the eternal spirit of God can say this to us. And please remember as we look at this as well, there is always a remnant with God. There is always a portion. Not all of them. There are some who are still at home on their knees praying. They are plagued by the evil they see around them, and they're asking God to help, to fix the hearts of men, to turn the hearts of men back to him. Watch my household. Guard me and guard my family, God. I am not immune to these things. I'm susceptible to it. Help me. Help me in your word every day that as I read it, I know that it applies to me. It's written for me. You love me. You want what's good for me. Help me to be strong in these things. By the words of Amos, the people of Israel are left with the awful uncertainty of the doom that is yet to come by the power of God's divine judgment. The Lord himself is drawing near for their punishment, and he has sworn by his own holiness, Amos 4, Verses 2 through 3. He says to them, I am coming. They did not respond properly to the previous acts of correction. Remember what they were. Famine, drought, blight, pestilence, and earthquake. None of them brought the people back to God. These were not final judgments, mind you. They were corrective measures by God. They did not cause the people to return to God because their hearts would not. 
Amos has now said to them, and again, this man's prophesying, he's telling them the truth about what's happened in the past, what's coming in the future, the attitude of their heart and their lives. He's telling them directly about who they are. And then he says to them, prepare to meet thy God. So the corrective measures from the past, that wasn't it. Prepare now, get ready, he is coming. They have been summoned as God's people to stand before God in some other form than what they have already seen and experienced. That is a very solemn and fearful thing. Prepare to meet thy God. In Hebrews 10 and verse 30, the Hebrew writer says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. The Hebrew writer concludes that passage by saying, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There are always two choices for mankind as they stand before God, as they consider His Word, God's will, the condition of their own heart and life. There's always two choices. One is to continue in rebellion, to live in sin against Him, and to say, I don't think He will. When I look around, things are going pretty well. God's blessed me in every way. I don't think He has an issue with what I'm doing. And stand in your rebellion. But you have been warned today by the Word of God that you must prepare to meet thy God. The other side of that is one who accepts the Lord for all that He is and that I am accountable to Him and I will submit gladly to know that there's a way to be saved. Gladly submit to a God who loves me. It's a far better picture of an individual whose heart is soft enough to say, I can evaluate these things. I can see that I'm wrong. I want to make it right. And God's made it possible. And I love him for that. So when we stand before God, it is not a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a marvelous thing to be held in the loving hands of Almighty God, who will wipe the tears from our eyes with his own finger. That's what I want, and I hope that's what you want as well. But be not deceived. God is not mocked. Hebrews 12 and verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Do not find yourself under the wrath of God. These people had a choice, so do we, and I thank God for that. If you need to respond this morning, do that while we stand together to sing to encourage you.